Good evening. Good evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, my name is Shane Stark uh, for the uh, League of Women Voters Education Fund, and I will be your moderator tonight for the Santa Barbara City Council uh, District 2 uh, Candidate Forum. I see many stalwart Mesa rats out there. Big cheer for the Mesa rats. So I want to welcome you here tonight. Uh, one word of caution, we run a civil forum here. If you throw fruit at the candidates, make sure it's from Mesa Produce. Make sure it's from Mesa Produce if you're through. It's man, soft, good idea, a public safety tip. Uh, the League of Women Voters uh, is nonpartisan and welcomes both women and men as members or donors to our educational activities. We neither support nor oppose political parties or candidates for office. We rather conduct these forums so you may have the opportunity to see and hear the candidates ask some questions and make up your own mind. If you have questions, uh, the lead president, where is Vijaya Jamalamadaka? Right there, and Rave Moran, our voter service chair, will be happy to answer uh, any questions. There are candidates material on the, is it outside that the candidates material are? candidates material uh, together with some League of Women Voters information. Uh, everybody is welcome to join the League. Scholarships are available. Uh, we're particularly interested in uh, young members at, at, at this point. You can also invite it to make a tax deductible contribution to the education fund. I noticed a ripple of amusement when I suggested extending the intergenerational reach of the League of Women Voter. It's happening, folks. It's happening. Uh, Transil Pro is translating uh, this program from English to Spanish, Transil Pro. Uh, headphones are available, if, or headphones available if you need to, uh, right over there. Uh, I remind you this is a civil issue-oriented forum. Please refrain from outbursts and displays signs, t-shirts, etc. Hold your applause for the end of the forum. This will enable us to get, discuss more questions and maintain a neutral tone. Also, please turn off your cell phones. As a matter of courtesy, unauthorized videos are not allowed. I'd like to introduce the candidates uh, for Second District City Council and thank them for participating. Tavis Boyce. Brian Campbell, Luis Esparza, Michael Jordan, Terry Jory. Uh, thank you. Uh, cards were passed out uh, at the beginning of the forum. I think we have more cards. Uh, if you have questions to be submitted, uh, please, uh, we'll ask them during the second part of the, of the forum after a break. If you need a card, signal to Vijaya over there. And please just write at the topic of your question at the top, a single subject, and be brief, briefly state uh, your question on the matter. We'll sort them and ask the questions after. OK. Each candidate will have a two-minute opening statement, and then we'll proceed. You will notice the candidates we've got a order of questioning, so make it reasonably painless. We've tried this as a century old formula. It's worked at least once. <laughs> no further promises. Uh, we'll start uh, in basically in alphabetical order, Mr. Boise. Uh, can you guys hear me? Is this thing on? <laughs> All right, my name's Tavis Boyce. Um, as you can see, I'm the youngest person on this forum right here. Uh, I've been a lifeguard at Hendry's Beach for many years and as an EMT as well. Um, I'm currently a grad student at Cal State Channel Islands, and I attended Santa Barbara City College here on the Mesa. I really like this town. It's a great place. Um, but the truth is that the future of your grandkids and my generation is up in the air. With climate change and the coming water crisis, uh, as well as changing economic forces, uh, our future is in great peril, and the decisions that we make today are going to have a lasting impact for generations to come. So I'm running to give you know, my generation, your kids, your grandkids, 
and their grandkids a seat at the policy table because their future matters. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Campbell. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Brian Campbell. I want to say thank you, everybody, for coming out to listen to us today, and thank you to everybody who's tuning in. Um, you can't, you want, I need me closer. You need me louder. Um, <laughs> so there we go. Uh, please excuse my appearance. I'm just running from coaching uh, little kids c football, which is one of the areas that I volunteer in. And I'm also being a single parent this week while my mother, well, my wife is out of town. It's been a hectic week with campaigning and two kids running them around back and forth, all the sports and activities and everything else. So, uh, so please excuse the jeans and sneakers. Um, I'm running for city council uh, for my children and for all of you. Uh, I'm a family man. I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm a family man. I'm a businessman. I'm a man of my community. Okay, everybody who knows me knows that if you have a problem, you come to me to solve it. So my past year history has been that I've managed a $200 million bond fund. I'm a trained attorney. Um, I'm a realtor. I negotiate contracts for a living, and I help run our family business. That's been a business for over two decades. So, and I'm running to apply all these principles and values to the city because, quite honestly, the city's kind of forgotten about these values, and they've forgotten that they're supposed to be working for all of us, not just the few. Um, when I decided to run, a bunch of Washington elementary families got together because we've noticed a serious decline in our neighborhoods and our city over the last several years. And I was chosen to run. When I was chosen, I went to Randy Rouse and I asked him if anybody was viable who was running for the position. And he said, no. So I'm running. And I quickly want to say that running for this campaign has reminded me why I moved here over 20 years ago. The sense of community, the sense of pride, the sense of coming out to support other people has been absolutely huge. And you may notice that as you drive around the city, you'll see my signs are everywhere uh, from the east side, San Roque, Montecito, Hope Ranch, and that's the support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sparza. Thank you, Mr. Stark and the League of Women Voters. I always appreciate these, this forum in particular. The, the question's always thoughtful, the coverage great. And I'm happy to be here. And why am I running? I'm running because uh, I want to win. I feel I'm the most qualified of this group. Um, I was a little late to the game and uh, one of the later entries into the race because when the parties were making their choice, I was barely pulling my papers. And I saw the field and I said, I, I want to leave a mark. You know, I'm born and raised here on the Mesa. I feel like I have some new ideas. I'm not beholden to anybody. I've raised enough money to be competitive, and I feel that that's all one should raise rather than raising more than what the job pays for itself. Um, it kind of raises questions of who you're beholden to, and I'll be beholden to you, the city uh, voters, the constituents, especially in this district and the Mesa. I'm not going anywhere. I feel I'm the only candidate with specific ideas. I'm not going to speak in generalities. I have some big ideas um, with regards to budgetary, uh, budgetary and framework and organizational type of ideas, but also smaller ideas that can make an everyday impact on, on the common um, problems that we all face every day. Uh, about myself, I'm uh, primarily an attorney, been practicing 15 years, unlike a lot of my classmates at USC Law who went to big firms in downtown LA, uh, I came back home. I came back home and uh, I've started um, my own practice, and it's it, and it's here we are, 15 years later, and uh, I feel that's one of the main things that gives me um, the experience necessary. Uh, some of my higher stakes matters have been amounts in controversy that rival the city budget. Uh, I dabble in real estate because who in Santa Barbara doesn't, and and who wouldn't, right? And lucky to to live in a place like this, and I, I want to make a difference. So I, I appreciate your vote, and I. I Thank you, especially to the League of Women Voters for having this. Thank you, and Mr. Jordan. Thank you. My name is Mike Jordan, and my wife and I are 30-year residents of the Mesa, have raised four children here during that time who all attended public schools, including City College. I bring the experience, skills, and knowledge of a 10-year planning commissioner, four-year water commissioner, over 10 years on both the board of Santa Barbara Downtown Organization and the Greater Santa Barbara Lodging and Restaurant Association. And I also served a four-year term as a Governor Brown appointee to the Regional Water Quality Board. I'm looking forward on working on our district issues, such as protecting and preserving our neighborhoods, 
making improvements right out here on Cliff Drive and improving safety for pedestrians, bicyclists, and safe routes to school, working to resolve the continuing impacts in the neighborhoods around City College with the students, and protecting and improving our parks, open spaces, beaches, and coastline. I'll also look, look to improve the look and feel of downtown Santa Barbara and our other business districts, focus business and housing development in areas that clearly only benefit the city, improve the city processes for businesses, address wildfire safety reforms, continuing sea level rise issues, um, address public pension cost impacts over the next six years. I'll handle district versus city uh, decisions in this manner. Something that's good for the district has to also be good for the city, and something that's good for the city has to also be good for the district. If you can't say that about that, then it needs more work. I'm supported by current and former elected, elected officials, including Randy Rouse, Hal Conklin, and Sheila Lodge, and groups such as the Sierra Club and Planned Parenthood, and a wide range of business, environmental, and social active advocacy groups across the city. I'm looking forward to hearing from you tonight and entering into this discussion with the rest of these candidates. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and Ms. Jory. Good evening, I'm Terry Jory. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting us and all of you for attending. I am a small business owner. I have a production company. I am a PhD from UCSB in political psychology. I serve on the District Attorney Human Trafficking Task Force, as well as the Mosquito and Vector Management District, ensuring public health. I'm also a fourth degree black belt and I teach self-defense to women and all genders around the world. In 2015, Alice from the Mesa paper recruited me to be on the board of our Mesa neighborhood. And that was my first foray into local politics where I got to experience changing the lives of my neighbors. I saw what was broken, fixed it, and started achieving success after success and continued delivering the change that we need right now. I have, with the support of the fire department, implemented the Mesa SAFE program. In collaboration with the Mesa Business Association, I've successfully advocated for crosswalks and a pedestrian bike path. I'm working with Mesa Architects on a community self-sustaining garden on the island in front of Rose Cafe, creating an arts renaissance to cover ugly traffic utility boxes with local art and ensuring that Thousand Steps Beach access gets repaired. As president of our Mesa neighborhood, you can see that I've been working to bring residents, business owners, and community leaders with divergent views together to discuss issues, reach consensus, and move forward to solve issues. That's the type of leadership we need more of at City Council. I hope that you will join me in voting for me. I would be honored to have your vote, and I will work hard for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all the candidates. Let's start the questions. We'll have up to a minute and a half minutes to answer each question. Please don't hesitate to give shorter answers. It's an art. <laughs> and, and if you actually agree with another candidate, you can say that. It won't cost you any votes if you agree with another <laughs> candidate. Uh, our timers right there, our award-winning timers, uh, will we'll hold up some signs when you have a minute and 30 seconds left. If you run out of time, a tone will sound, which is the exact replica of the original foghorn at the Mesa Lighthouse. <laughs> you don't want to hear that, that hideous tone. Uh, we'll, you have a, a, a thing in front of you. We will rotate uh, the order of questions according to our centuries-old League of Women Voters formula. The first question will start with Mr. Campbell. Uh, it's on the role of city council members and citizen communication. Under the city charter, the city council acts for the whole city and has financial duties regarding city public funds. How you balance serving and protecting the entire city 
with listening to and representing the citizens of the people of the second district and how you communicate with your constituents. I'm sorry, what was the first question? Because that's not the first question that went out in the email. It's a two-parter. The first question is how do you balance serving the whole city with serving the district? And the right. second part is how do you propose to communicate with the people in the district? Oh, well, uh, that's pretty easy, as, uh, as I agree with Mike what said about district and city, is that we're all people, we're all family, we're all community. There's 90,000 of us plus here. We all need to get along. What's good for one is good for a lot, but not everybody. Just like with all families and communities, there are strifes and differences. Just like a beach community has different needs than a community in San Roque. And it's tough to balance these personalities. And that's one of the things with running a business with 213 people. That's a lot of different personalities that I have to manage all the time. Mm -hmm. Having children, we're used to it. You can't always turn around and be exactly equal for every single child. You always try to and you love each and every child equally. And that's the same with the city versus district, is that we love each district equally, but each one has its own unique needs. As far as communication goes, I have an open line of communication. Many of you know that. Many of you have sent me emails and you're shocked that I reply within a very short period of time. Or I've gotten calls from you. My line is open to everybody. That's how we run our business. That's how we run our family. That's what we do. And communication with each other is incredibly important. And there's been a lack of transparency from this city and a lack of communication on many different issues. And I hope to change that. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Jory, you're next. As a small business owner, I know how to stretch every dollar, and I'm not afraid to ask the hard questions of how our tax dollars are being spent. And I'll make sure our district's priorities are the city's priorities. Um, the city sales and occupancy taxes appear to be recovered from the impact of the Montecito debris flow and the Thomas fire and um, continue to be on a fairly stable income with modest growth in transient occupancy tax. Measure C, um, the recent sales tax increase is providing funding to address the backlog of our road and vital infrastructure, along with building a new police station. Our city workers, um, since the Great Depression, recession, have been taking on a greater portion of the pension funding and absorbing medical costs. As your council member, I will balance all that that's going on with the city with our district because whatever's important to the district is important to the city. Right now, always as president of our Mason neighborhood, I have an open door policy and I'm there to listen. And that's what has made me an effective leader, is listening. Because I learn from my constituents, and they know that they're being heard. And that's what makes it a win-win situation. The community thri <coughs> excuse me, thrives and wins. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jordan, you're next. I want to get uh, right out in front and tonight agree with Brian agreeing with me, that's, uh, that's always a good point. <laughs> that's a, um, and that's a, I, a I, double I, agreement. Always not, not often, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I do think I, I've jumped that question, and I truly mean that uh, a decision that's being worked on uh, for the interest and consideration of this district has to also be good for the city and vice versa. And if you can't answer that question affirmatively, then uh, the consideration needs more work. I don't agree with Brian in that this is easy. Um, if there's 80 people in the room, there's 100 opinions in the room. Um, I just left five hours of planning commission early, and they're talking about revisions to the AUD apartment uh, building uh, uh, process, and if you want to know about opinions in the room, that's a good place to start. But I think it's important as a, as a council member to be engaged, transparent, and inclusive. And I especially agree with the inclusive part. In this day and age, whatever the gap is, a wealth gap, gender gap, age gap, um, what, whatever, the, whatever the gap is, it's all that more important to stay out of your frame of reference and be in other people's frame of reference while you're working on that consideration. And that's what I intend to do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boy. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm going to dogpile on, on these two and jump on, on board and say that, uh, yes, 
this district, uh, you know, we've, we, uh, running up here, have all gotten very familiar with it. We know it's neighborhoods like the back of our hand. But when we get elected, um, ultimately, we're going to be representing the entire city of Santa Barbara. That being said, um, you know, we have a, a great city, but we need to be going in a specific direction. That direction uh, is around climate change. We need to be getting ready for sea level rise and preparing uh, our infrastructure for the coming damage of, of climate change. As far as communication goes with our district and with the rest of the city, um, I think all of us up here have websites and phone numbers that you can call day and night. I've actually talked to other candidates on the city council uh, and their phones are always blowing up with text messages or notifications. There's an application called Nextdoor that I think a lot of you might be using where you can get in touch with a, a city council representative. Uh, a way that I like to actually meet um, constituents and, and meet with people is actually at the beach. That's kind of my favorite place to be in the ocean. So if, if you ever want to talk, I'll, I'm likely down at Mesa Lane or Hendry's Beach in a lifeguard tower or, or surfing. So please join me for a board meeting down there. Yeah. Board meeting. Good one. <laughs> that's subtle. Surf reference. I think that's surfing. Uh, Mr. Esparza. So th this is one where I differ with probably all the candidates I'm here, and I think it's important. It's an important difference. Uh, first and foremost, I will serve the constituents, the district. You are the ones who vote for us and will put us in office, so your opinion matters the most. And I don't think it's as simple as what's good for the city, what's good, for, or that's what it has to be. Uh, that totally disregards the number one issue that you see in the local politics, which is NIMBYism. Uh, and the project on District 2 on the east side is an example of the, the uproar that can happen when something that might be good for the city overall, people don't want it in their neighborhood. So I want to make that clear that I will represent and serve primarily the district first and the voters of the Mesa and not forget that you are part of what's basically a board of directors running the entity of the city, which we also owe a fiduciary duty to. Um, I think, um, so that's how I'll handle that balance. In terms of accessibility and communication, uh, I'm, I'm around here every, every day. I'm either at the Mesa Center or Shoreline Plaza. It's where I, I try to support local businesses. I do my daily shopping. So please feel free to, to approach me and, and ask me a question. Um, I, I can come off as a bit reserved and shy, but I think once I open up and you get to know me, you'll see that I can, um, I can relate to, to almost anybody. Um, also phone, email, text, all those things are, are good as well. And I welcome for you, even prior to getting elected, is please contact me if you want to discuss some of these issues more in detail. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about climate crisis. I would like to point out that there is an error in the chart. Uh, Mr. Campbell should be going third, and Mr. Jordan should be going fifth on this particular question. Apologize a break in the seemingly infallible organizing system. <laughs> Mr. Esparza, you, uh, you are first, and the question is, what should the city do regarding the climate crisis? Please be specific about actions you favor for utility system resiliency, disaster preparation, and carbon footprint reduction. That's a lot. Well, first, we need to give ourselves and the city credit. Um, we, the city has come a long way from, if you all remember when we were discussing where to draw a blue line, and that's pretty much what the talk was, and it got um, realtors up in a, in a storm because that would lead to disclosures and so forth. So there's been a lot of action since then, and I think the city deserves a lot of credit in terms of, um, of taking steps to, towards community choice energy. Uh, now that those steps have been taken, the devil will be in the details of the type of, type of joint powers agreement that is reached with the city and the other people in the, um, who pool their buying resources to have more choices of where energy comes from. I think the city needs to take more steps to get people out of their cars. Um, on a bigger level, in terms of encouraging the types of visitors we have here, it'd be nice to see our airport used more, which it seems to be. It's really kind of uh, improving over there and a lot more flights and, um, and uh, routes. Uh, the only other ways to get here would be really train and, 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 um, um, and boat. And I'm open to that. Anything to avoid having cars come into the city, or not avoid, but encourage the other modes. Um, the city, one of the plans of action I have, so the specificity I was referring to earlier on is on my website, d2sb.com. I'm trying to put specific plans of action that are, uh, you know, concrete things that we can do as a city to take steps towards, towards uh, the different goals that we have with regards to housing and climate change and so forth. But it's something that the city needs to be applauded. We have um, a climate, uh, a sea rise level plan that we've been working on. These things are available online. You can see what already the city has done, and we can build on that. Thank you. Mr. Boyce? Yeah, 
I'm going to point out really quickly that uh, flights have the largest carbon footprint of probably anything else you do, so expanding the airport is a really bad idea in that regard. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to, to compliment the city because uh, the city has a 100% renewable energy goal by 2030. Uh, and as all of you know, energy is on everyone's minds. Um, so Cal Edison and PG&E have given out warnings to all of California saying that power might be going out uh, in more frequent and longer outages. Uh, my sister hasn't had uh, energy or power. She's in Humboldt right now uh, since Tuesday. And about a million people in California do not have electricity right now. That being said, we need to make serious investments in renewable energy, uh, also in battery storage technology for energy. Uh, and we need to be prepared for the worst. Because when the power goes out, when SoCal Edison gives us two days time to prepare, that's not enough. Uh, as far as carbon storage goes, um, we need to start looking towards natural ecosystems such as creek restoration and wetland habitat restoration because ultimately nature is better at conserving and sequestering carbon than we are. Uh, wetlands are, are great stores of, of carbon um, and so looking towards nature for inspiration is probably our best approach. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Well, I want to start out by saying our Mother Earth here is four and a half billion years old. The Ice Age was two and a half million years ago. The our Earth has been warming for the last two and a half million years. We've been tracking climate change for the last 120 years. Do we really, really know what affects climate change? Some people say they do. Let's start with landfills. Let's start with how about you vote with your wallet and stop buying things from countries like China and India that dump into our oceans and dump in landfills. Do you know that 45% of our plastic in the US comes from China? And you know, everybody feels really great when they dump that plastic back in the recycle bin and it gets shipped back to China. And we have this clear conscience that we recycled. What do you think China does with that plastic? It winds up in a landfill or an ocean. How is that being conscientious? How is that being environmentally friendly? Sorry, it just really bugs me that people think they're being environmentally friendly when they're constantly using items that wind up in a landfill. You know, landfills are some of the largest producers of climate warming gases. It is. And that's what we need to take a look at. I say you vote with your wallets, okay? Environmental stuff should be less expensive so people can turn around and afford LED light bulbs and solar panels. And be more conscientious about what you do and what you put in the trash, please. Thank you. Ms. Jory. I just want to say that these questions would be, make a great dissertation, all of them. And we're doing them all in a minute and a half. Um, Anyways, the birthplace of the environmental movement shouldn't just talk about being green. We need to return to being an environmental leader. Climate change is impacting our future, and we all must do our part to bring those green gas emissions down and enhance resilience. One way is to bring vehicle miles driven down. According to a city report, the city is still not running on 100% renewable electricity, biogas, propane, or CNG. The city can and must do better. We need to turn the entire fleet over to 100% renewable energy, add multiple charging stations throughout the city, and implement bike share programs throughout the city. No more sitting on the sidelines. We need to get busy and make a plan, making Santa Barbara's future, wonderful for your children and my twins and your grandchildren. As president of our Mesa neighborhood, I've successfully advocated for walkways and bike paths. So to improve mobility and to have a cleaner environment so those who visit, study, and work and visit here without their cars can do so. Thank you. And Mr. Jordan. Well, there's absolutely no benefit in going last on this question. So uh, <laughs> I agree with everybody else. Um, the single largest uh, cause of our issue, of course, is our vehicles. And my keys are in my pocket, as, are, as I'm sure are yours. And the, de the devil in the details is we need to find a way to get you and me out of our vehicles more. And what does that look like? That looks like not what traditional transit exists now, 
in 50 passenger buses that run at capacity in the morning and at, at rush hour in the afternoon and run vacant the rest of the time. But it looks like smaller, more mobile, possibly electric type golf cart vehicles that use modern technology to come when you demand it, work in area, and drop you off like a small little Uber or Lyft. Those type of innovations need to be applied to the masses so we're not being forced to give up our choices, but we readily have an avenue to go forward. Um, I usually love Tavis's answer on this subject because I think he's the guy on this subject. But in addition to what he said too, it's obvious that we need uh, more control and a local choice, local menu choice for energy dependence that doesn't depend on energy generation a thousand miles away and then being sent over cables a thousand miles that could cause fire. We need to look into solar, battery storage, and resiliency locally rather than dependence outside of our city. Thank you. I think we're ready for the next question. Um, the next question is about Cliff Drive. We're going to talk about Cliff Drive uh, succinctly. What is your vision for Cliff Drive? And particularly, what do you want to achieve with respect to the area the, around uh, the Mesa Center, the, uh, the Miggs Cliff intersection, and the City College area? And we'll start with. Mr. Jordan. I, I, I envision that as more of a uh, neighborhood boulevard than a, the freeway it is now. Um, I'd like to see at least a pair of uh, crosswalks on each side of Meg's. I'd like to see uh, a road diet, what we call road diet, so that the it's down to one lane going each direction with enhanced and protected uh, bicycle lanes, enhanced landscaping. Uh, good for uh, pedestrians, good for bicyclists, good for just getting out there and standing around. Um, I, have, I do have some concerns as a result of the campfire that I'm not really sold yet on actually infrastructure changes to reduce the width of Cliff Drive. I think sometime, if not in my lifetime, in my kid's lifetime, that we're going to have an inundation event down in the harbor, and there's going to be people coming this way to get away, or we're going to have a fire running down Las Positas Drive and Hidden Valley, and we're going to have people bailing out of Hope Ranch and needing this escape, too. So uh, I advocate for keeping the hardscape width as it is now, but employing other methods to reduce the uh, intensity of Cliff Drive and increase the availability for multimodal transportation uh, uses that make it look more like a, uh, a slow little neighborhood lane. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sparza. So I think there needs to be a proper balance struck between the fact that it's our major thoroughfare. I mean, it, is, it was a highway that Caltrans owned and the city uh, acquired ownership of it. And since then, there's been some improvements, the restriping, that taking out the four lanes and having the middle turn lane where we are right now. It would be nice to see that restriping um, continued. That would, that would help uh, turn it in more into this pedestrian, bicycle-friendly thing that I think it should become. Uh, uh, the, I've been calling for that for a while, since uh, four years ago when I ran. That, that was a topic, as well as the crosswalks. And I think an appropriate location for the crosswalk or a, at least one more would be at Camino Calma, which is appropriately named, and it's right there uh, that connects the Mesa Center to the other side. Um, it'd be nice if crosswalks didn't cost a million dollars to install, uh, because that's what those ones with the flashing lights and the effective ones cost. Uh, a a low-cost measure that could help increase pedestrian safety, because I know when I walk with my son on that to, to go to the areas of commerce, uh, is just some sort of guardrail or, or, or something that separates the sidewalk from the street. Um, it is a little uh, daunting when there's cars flying by at 40 and, and more miles per hour. Um, it would be nice to see things that would improve the, the, the commerce. So, but I mean by that, it would be nice to have a farmer's market up here. It would be nice to have uh, activities that are usually reserved for downtown, like First Thursdays, uh, things that would increase the use of all our, our great restaurants. And, and, and there's also night, uh, late evening things that we can enjoy up here where it gets kind of quiet after 8 p.m., um, Okay. Uh, Ms. Jory. I just want to say that the crosswalks cost $50,000, not a million dollars. Um, with three elementary schools, City College, <clears throat> and our thriving business district, we have all types of people using mixed modes of transportation competing for space on Cliff Drive. Of all ages, 
trying to get to their destination safely. Cars, bicycles, pedestrians. Cliff Drive is now a danger zone. I've been working as president of our Mason neighborhood with Rob Dayton and Derek Bailey from Public Works, successfully advocating for, clip, for crosswalks, which were not in the initial proposal. And I did that talking in front of council, initiating a, a mail ride in, and also holding lots of community meetings. Um, the pedestrian bike path will go from Henry's Beach to City College, and we are also going to be having another community meeting next Thursday, 6 o'clock at Monroe, and that's important so we can get this grant. It's important to have the community feedback. Um, it's important to have the crosswalks and the pedestrian bike paths so our children have safe routes to school. Our neighbors are healthier. Our environment is cleaner. Our bikers are safer. It's all very important for our community and something that we've been fighting for for a long time. As your council member, I will ensure this gets completed. Thank you. And Mr. Campbell. Well, as you can all hear by all the cars going by outside, it is a major thoroughfare. But bottom line is cars drive way too fast down Cliff Drive. It's impossible for children to cross to go to schools, parks, friends' houses. We need to slow traffic down. I appreciate that the city is looking into getting a state grant to impose or to do all these work that we're talking about. But the city has said if they don't get the state grant, they're not going to do anything. The reality is, is at a minimum, we need to slow traffic down through the commerce areas and all the way down through here so people can cross safely. And at a minimum, we need two crosswalks. This mile and a quarter stretch between City College and here is way too long to not have any of the residences above Cliff Drive to be able to, to get down below. So with that being said, we can easily lower the speed limit. We just have to lobby the city to do it. We want crosswalks. We need to turn around and tell the city, look, we need crosswalks. They're 50000 a piece. You know how construction goes. It's going to cost a little more than that. But we need to do these things. We can't wait for a state grant that might come through in a year and a half. The city applied for grants in MODOC and Las Positas and forgot about Cliff Drive. That's wrong. I mean, this issue has been around for a very, very long time. Let's lobby the city to make a change. Thank you. And Mr. Boyce. Yeah, I'm actually going to bounce back to climate change because I think this is an issue we can't drop right now, especially in, in this incredibly heated political climate. Uh, part of this district actually is over in the harbor area. It's around um, three feet above sea level. If you've ever looked at any climate change maps, any sea level rise maps on NOAA or NASA's websites, uh, you can clearly see that a lot of those areas are going to be totally flooded. Those are neighborhoods, that's businesses, that's part of Cliff Drive itself. Um, Something I think that we really need to start considering um, is an artificial wetland to get built all along our entire beachfront. Um, wetlands are great because they both sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. They provide uh, critical habitat for biodiversity um, that will support our ecosystem services. And they help protect against coastal flooding. And if you guys uh, are familiar with nature, nature never happens slowly. It happens really fast, especially in this town with um, fires and mudslides. Uh, we're likely to see lots of coastal flooding in the, in the near future and in the next uh, 100 years. Um, a lot of the IPCC's uh, forecasts for climate change are, I think, um, or not I think, they are <laughs> quite subdued and they're lowball estimates. My generation is going to be seeing Santa Barbara <laughs> get flooded, uh, quite frankly, and I think talking uh, about it is really important. We cannot ignore the fact that uh, climate change is real. We've known about it for decades now. The science is, is uh, quite certain and frankly, bringing up talking points uh, from Fox News is irresponsible. Thank you. Uh, we're on to the next question, and I'm going to – the next question is about housing. I think I got that right. Yeah. The next question is about housing. What is uh, – as you may know, the governor signed, I think, 18 bills today to encourage housing uh, approval by cities. Um, I'm not going to ask you to rattle them off. That, that, that. <laughs> And that, that wouldn't be sporting, I, I think. Uh, what's your preferred approach to providing housing for all economic segments of the city? Zoning, public housing, improved development review, inclusionary conditions, transit development, uh, and anything else you can think of. How can you make housing more affordable? Take your best shot. Uh, oh, we'll start with Ms. Jory. 
Um, I just want to respond to Brian that uh, the city did not forget about Cliff Drive when they did Las Positas. It's all, it's all planned out. Um, workforce housing is needed to invigorate our local economy and serve our community. If you work in our community, then you should have a place of access and a safe and affordable place to call home. Previously, the redevelopment agency produced high quality affordable housing. Since it's been abolished, the city has failed to create a viable plan to move forward. This needs to change. With the city knowing that it needs to create housing for our workforce families and the state of California mandating the acceleration of multi-housing units, we need to move forward with our community-driven plan that will shape Santa Barbara's future for years to come. Working together, carefully managing growth, we can simultaneously build workforce housing and also keep our neighborhoods how they should be. Um, we also must require that high density rental housing provide some affordable units for our workforce. The council is finally moving forward with this concept, the inclusionary rule, but it lagged for years in the planning commission. A community cannot be just for the haves. A community won't thrive with people who can afford to only buy housing who come up on the weekend. We need workforce housing. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Jordan, you're next. I don't get to rattle off all 18 of them, huh? You could, uh, if you can, but, you can do it in a minute yeah, and a so, half. Um, you get extra credit. Uh, that was yesterday. <laughs> Governor Newsom signed 18 bills and, uh, and a few more bills also having to do with uh, <coughs> accessory dwelling units in single family neighborhoods. And um, I will tell you, I don't often quote uh, Supervisor Williams when he was a council member, but uh, I believe that. Uh, one thing that lingers with me on this issue is that it's a war against our children. And it's an inability or an unwillingness on our part to uh, accept change that allows for the next generation and the next generation to grow up here, get a job here, and live here because of a lack of affordable housing. Um, one of these days in, in other states and one of these days here, if we do not adapt and adapt well, we will, we will suffer the same consequence of losing single-family residence zoning. That has already happened in other states where a lot in your neighborhood is turned into a fourplex or a sixplex, a sixplex apartment. So uh, we live in a pretty blessed place on this side of the hill. I will support um, uh, continuing to protect single-family neighborhoods and directing the housing emphasis into areas that support transportation, are close to jobs, and also target not workforce housing, but the, the two areas that we are most efficient on, and that's low income and very low income housing. We continue to separate the gap, the wealth gap and the masses by only putting housing together to benefit those that are well off. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mr. Boyd. <laughs> uh, by a show of hands, which, uh, can the candidates raise their hand if they are a renter? I'm the only renter on this panel. And actually, 59% of Santa Barbara residents are renters, uh, which is kind of a crazy statistic. Um, and if you bought a house in 1990 or 1980s, uh, then you got really lucky because housing prices are uh, exorbitant right now. Um, and there's no chance that my generation, especially myself, will ever own a home with college debt uh, and wage stagnation. Uh, that being said, I'm going to talk about, <laughs> about AB 1482, which just got passed uh, yesterday by Gav Governor Newsom. Um, this bill is a great bill that uh, our city is going to have to adopt, and it has to do with rent regulation. Um, it caps uh, rental increases by commercial units uh, to 5% a year plus inflation, which is awesome for renters, the majority of Santa Barbara. Um, and also the city council uh, this past spring uh, passed a bill um, that would make it mandatory that 10% of new units being built are affordable or market rate. Uh, I echo the, the concerns of uh, Councilman Gutierrez that it needs to be 15% or more uh, because honestly 10% is not going to cut it. The pushback we're going to talk about uh, is from developers who say, oh, we can't afford to do that many that are, that are affordable housing, which is ridiculous because look at the housing prices in this town. Uh, developers are always going to want to build here um, and especially uh, considering we haven't built very many housing in the last 40 years. So. Housing is unaffordable. 
we need more affordable units. Thanks. Mr. Esparza. I'm going to approach this issue from a, a more of an ec economic perspective. Um, and it's hard to have this conversation without discussing the, the, the state law because especially Senate Bill 330, uh, the one that might take away power from the local governments to do what's their central job, which is land use and planning with regards to ha housing and the streamlining of, streamlining of permitting and so forth. Um, so anything that increases supply for whether you're a renter or you're a homeowner, the more supply there is and in a small town like this, even a few more units makes a big difference uh, for that person looking to buy or looking to rent. So we need policies geared to increase supply and that's also density within reason. And, and also you hear that we're all built out. Let's build down, let's use technology and go underground and, 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 and that. So um, the housing authority, the Santa Barbara deserves a, again credit for, for doing things, um, big things. They just recently spent $4 million purchasing something on North La Cumbra that's geared towards affordable housing. Uh, if the city's gonna continue to employ so many people, which I think it's up to about 1,500 employees, any other large employer like that in the area looks at employee housing, uh, cottage and UCSB and so forth. So if we're gonna continue to have such a large workforce for a small city, maybe that's something that the city needs to explore too. And um, Projects need to uh, pencil out for developers. You know, I, I would have been okay probably with 10% as an inclusionary housing requirement because that seems to pencil out for them, but I'd be highly suspicious of any amounts higher because uh, things won't get built. They're the ones building, building things. Thank you, and Mr. Campbell. You know, again, there's definitely not enough time to discuss about our housing shortage, what the causes are. We can say it's simple supply and demand. Housing has always been expensive here. I bought my first house here back in the 90s. I was, you know, living on a boat that leaked like a sieve. My house cost four times the amount of a house that cost all my friends back in New York. It's always been an issue. We need more housing. We need to make it more affordable. We want our children to live here. We need to pull down the roadblocks that have been in existence in this city for decades that prevent people from building in a cost-effective and timely manner. And look at our labor costs. I mean, maids, housekeepers make 25 to 35 dollars an hour so it's easy to say hey contractors you're making too much money but is it really i mean our cost of labor and our cost of land is much more expensive than as many other places if our freeway was three lanes down to ventura it would be easier for people to commute from other areas if it took less time than three years to build then more people would build if the abr didn't argue and say hey I don't like a metal fence, I want a wood fence, and you go back and forth and back and forth, it would make it much friendlier for people to build houses. And again, we also have the issue where people don't want duplexes and quads, plexes in zoned areas that are in their backyard. So we have a lot of issues that need to be discussed that can't be covered right now. Thank you. And what, uh, uh or for the observations, there are two things that people in California hate. One is sprawl, and the other is density. <laughs> I want to bear that in mind. Uh, the next question I'd like to ask is about homelessness. Uh, how do you view the issue of homelessness in Santa Barbara as primarily an issue of law enforcement, social services, health and behavioral wellness services, housing supply, or a combination? What are your priorities in addressing this issue? And uh, we'll start with the same order that we used for the opening statement, uh, which would be Mr. Boyce goes first. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think Terry, I'm going to preempt Terry right now. She's going to talk about how she teaches karate to homeless people, which is super awesome. Um, I, have, <laughs> I actually don't do that. I'm a lifeguard, and I've encountered uh, those who are not privileged enough to own a house uh, on a daily basis down at the beach. Uh, when you think about housing in Santa Barbara, when you think about a lot of the issues we've been talking about, it seems to come down to who owns a house and who doesn't. Are you fortunate enough to own a house in Santa Barbara? That means you're an insider, you're part of the club. If you don't, if you're a renter, if you're a student here, or if you're homeless, then you are shut out of the conversation, which I think is, is sad, uh, because it shows the lack of civility in this town. Uh, I'm a little bit ashamed of the, uh, the east side um, debacle that happened recently, where uh, the proposal was to have 14 uh, homeless people get put into housing and uh, they'd have caseworkers and they'd be vetted and the nimbyism that showed up to that, not in my backyard, showed up to that event was um, drastic and scary and, and simply ridiculous. And so I think that we need to really take a stand because a lot of people that are homeless here go to school here. 
they work here, they lifeguard with me, <laughs> they work out of their cars, uh, and they just want a better future. So they deserve uh, you know, empathy in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Campbell. Yeah, homelessness is uh, something that I have been talking about for a couple of years, and that's been one of my main issues I talk about. While my opponents have said all we need is a day center downtown from the hangout, and or they don't see them when they go on their daily jogs, um, homelessness is a pervasive social issue. It's a humanitarian issue that we have with us. It's going to be with us for a very long time. It brings up public safety issues. I've been warning about fires and encampments for months now, and look what happened over on Bass Street, where a bunch of houses almost got burned by the campfires. I've been talking about violence from homeless people. We've had two stabbings in the park recently. The DA's office was prosecuting five sexual assault cases. Panhandlers target young women up and down State Street. Uh, our city has become known as a filthy, unsafe city. This is what I hear. I have clients coming in from out of town. I grew up in New York. I watched this happen. I was there for the Giuliani days. With that being said, is that, and I know Mike loves the butt, we can't group them all together. Many of them are people who lost their jobs that don't have credit scores well enough to get housing. We need to help these people. There are many of them that have mental health issues. We need to help them. This city has had collaborative measures detailed out since the 80s, 2002, the countywide brain home, ending chronic homelessness, 2011, C3H, where Mayor Murillo was the vice chair of the policy committee. We have had policies and committees for decades. Let's see some follow through. The real answer is permanent supportive housing, and it doesn't have to be in prime downtown locations. Please talk to me after this. Thank you. Mr. Sparza. Yeah, so what I don't hear a lot in this discussion are solutions. You know, we can't just go round people up, and, and there has to be first compassion. So, first of all, I'll say that's not a law enforcement issue, uh, or it shouldn't be. Uh, I, I think law enforcement would agree with that and calls for service that relate to somebody being where maybe people don't want them to are going to get that type of priority and, and not even get responded to. So uh, some of the solutions I'm proposing are, are continuation of supporting a lot of private service providers. Uh, the county has a great problem that minimizes the criminalization. Um, uh, known as the co-response co team, where if there's going to be any law enforcement contact that it's coupled with uh, behavioral wellness or social workers, and again, trying to gear people towards services um, that, that if they're so receptive. Uh, the recent increase, I have a hypothesis that it has to deal with some of our criminal justice reform, where a lot of people that were usually in prisons are now in local jails. Our local jails are full, so the sheriff lets them out. And some of the new people um, on the streets, um, in my opinion, are, are, are recently released from um, incarceration. So that might be a preventative measure where the city can invest in some post-release resources to help people from ending up on the street in the first place. Um, but yeah, we need to be compassionate. We need to lessen criminalization and make it not a law enforcement issue. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. Couldn't agree more on the compassion uh, standpoint. Uh, if I have um, probably one armchair quarterback uh, look back over the past 10 years, it's that uh, from where we started to where we are now, we seem to be uh, in a uh, resource-rich uh, environment that maintains the problem rather than leads to uh, answers to the problem. Uh, the legal climate now prevents us from moving homeless people along off of public spaces. Uh, until they have a place to go, we can't touch them. So I have been advocating for a day center with resources in the downtown adjacent area to take care of that problem. But it all really comes down to the definition of homelessness, and that's people without a home. Um, Tave, I agree with Tavis. Uh, the east side, uh, I was actually in the room for that. It was poorly presented, but the reaction was also a poor reaction. And it's a, another example that followed also the Little Homes uh, proposal on the Castillo parking lot near downtown, too, that will have gotten 40 homeless people, chronic homeless people, off the street the next day, put them in a 24-7 supervised environment with social workers, professional hospital workers, police supervision, and the community blowback was too much. Um, and one other minor point, too. The Aliso Street is not about homeless people. Those people used to be homeless. They have already transitioned out of homelessness, and they are moving into that position, moving into that residential status. So it was not about housing homeless people. It was about housing neighbors. Thank you. And Ms. Jory. 
Thank you, Tavis, for mentioning I teach self-defense to homeless. I wasn't going to mention it, but thank you. And I also, I also agree with Mike about the day center. Um, but it's important that we recognize that there's no one-size-fits-all reason for homelessness. Um, I'm encouraged with the Housing First model that's being proposed and implemented by the United Way and Home for Good. Um, I also think that if people have a home, they're going to be less of a nuisance. Um, we also need to recognize that we can't house everybody and that there are going to be some that are going to be non-compliant. So law enforcement and city workers need to have the tools that they need to keep them safe while they're keeping the community safe. Even though mental health and substance abuse, which many homeless people have, is a county function, many times it's the city workers that come in contact with the homeless first. So I do propose that we have a day center. And I think that even if it's just for a few hours, it will decrease the exposure that residents, visitors, and city workers have when they come in contact. I would also, as your council member, proactively support a task force that's made up of clergy, mental health, law enforcement, and the housing authority. I think together they need to work energetically to be able to solve this problem. Thank you. Uh, we'll try to get one or two more questions in before the break. Uh, if you got, don't forget, write down your questions on the card and, and give, them, give them to our, uh, our folks over there and we'll sort them. We'll take a 10 minute break at the point. Our next question is about city finances. I have to know about city finances. How would you describe the financial position of the city of Santa Barbara? What potential revenue measures, tax revenues, uh, or cost reduction, staff reduction, privatization of things, uh, would improve, in your opinion, the city's financial sustainability? And we'll start with Mr. Campbell, then Ms. Jory, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Boyce, Mr. Esparza. So, Mr. Campbell, your Well, thank you. Uh, city finances, the city has a $156 million budget. About 72% goes off to salaries and pensions. That's average for a city of this size. We have 7 million visitors that come here every year that spend $2 billion in the South Coast. Generates a lot of revenue. I'm going to circle back to the homelessness. Everybody talks about how it's so great that we have a plan, and all of a sudden everybody's discovered, hey, housing first. Here is all the initiatives since 1980 of great plans. Every one of these says housing first. Every one of these says work with the city of Goleta, work with the city of Carpinteria. We're going to work with the homeless people. We're going to work with all the organizations in town. As I said, Mayor Marilla was on the following the policy chair for C3H in 2011. When is the city actually going to follow through on being humanitarian? The ACLU has turned around and helped held an Eighth Amendment right. You cannot remove a homeless person from the street unless you have a bed for them. A day center doesn't give them a place, doesn't give them a home, doesn't give them some place to go overnight, okay? We need to create permanent supportive housing. It doesn't have to be brand new housing. We need temporary shelters immediately so we can bring them in get them out of the cold, stop starting fires in our woods and our bushes so they don't burn our city down and create another Thomas fire. We need to turn around and actually take a look at those who actually truly need mental wellness and get them help. Those that have jobs but don't have credit reports or otherwise to get into housing, we need to help them into housing. Honestly, this is the first time, this is the first year we're all gonna work collaboratively together. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jury. Um, how would you describe the financial position of the city and, and what would you do about it? The 2020 combined operating budget is roughly $339 million uh, with a com combined capital budget totaling roughly uh, $63 million. And like I had previously said before, our sales and occupancy taxes appear to be um, recovered from the impact of our disasters. Um, our transient occupancy tax seems to be having a modest growth. Um, our pension liability from our workers is increasing, as is their medical care. So we do need to raise revenue. It's very important. And how do we do that? Well, it's, 
I think a really good reason how to do that, and one of the reasons I'm running, is because we do need to invigorate our downtown and other commercial areas. It's very important. Um, additionally, the city is expecting $800,000 from cannabis taxes in 2020. And with an increased revenue, the city can provide residents with services that they need or would be helpful to them, such as enhancing park hours, more services for our children and teens, adults and seniors, assisting the homeless and the mental, mentally ill, and also supporting our arts, bringing art into the community, creating community events, which is very important that we need right now. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jordan. So that uh, thumping on the table you just heard a few minutes ago uh, certainly hasn't solved the homelessness problem, but it certainly saved lives over the last 10 years. How many lives would have been lost if, other than for that thumping on the table? Um, our city's finances are really strong. Our reserves are at their highest level ever. Uh, we're humming along well. We are in a six-year period where we're seeing a little over a million dollar uh, up, uptick every year for uh, the re the refiguring of the uh, CalPERS uh, budget liability. So uh, our, our CalPERS numbers for our, our contribution are going to go from 23 million to 30 million by 2025. Um, we will weather that as we always have weathered waves in CalPERS before, but it's exasperated a little bit by an underfunctioning economic base downtown. It makes it all the more important to get community agreement on what we want to do downtown, get housing downtown, get services downtown, um, lighten up the uh, permitting and approval processes so the businesses can get up, get on their feet and run, quit the, uh, the heavy-handed oversight over the businesses while they're in force and be a little more flexible. Um, but I think uh, overall I have no complaint with how the city's being managed, run. I think we're the envy of many cities in California. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boyce. Yeah, I'm going to echo uh, a lot of those uh, facts that were just said, um, especially in the, in the face of a coming recession. Um, we're likely to be hitting an economic downturn, and that being said, uh, retail sales and tax revenue is going to drop, uh, especially in commercial businesses. Uh, I think tax increases uh, to property owners is probably coming, um, and I'm going to promise you one thing right now. I will never cut a budget or, or anything for schools because uh, kids can't get that back. Um, you start laying off teachers and condensing classes, uh, that just leads to mayhem, and uh, that's something that you really can't put a price on. Uh, as far as the economic outlook for the city, I think things are going to get a little bit more scary before they get better. Um, climate change is going to be uh, displacing a lot of the businesses down to the funk zone, um, and with changing economic forces every day, a lot of commerce is going online, uh, a lot more stores are going to be going out of business on State Street. That's going to be the reality. Um, a lot of the retail stores have already gone out of business that landlords are waiting for to come back. These flagship stores, they aren't, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, and so being creative with uh, the use downtown, being creative with the space, um, providing uh, more housing and trying to motivate uh, young entrepreneurs to move into those spaces could create additional tax revenue. I want to just acknowledge and address the huge tax uh, revenue engine over here, Santa Barbara City College brings in thousands of students every single year who contribute to our community in positive ways. Uh, not only in buying goods and services, but also just by, be, by being part of our community. Thank you. Mr. Sparza, I think it's yours. Thank you. Uh, this is another question. Well, it's a good question to correct a misstatement earlier about the million dollar crosswalk. I probably was referring to the roundabouts. Um, and another question that I think my answer differs than the uh, everyone up here. Um, things are appear to be strong on, on the surface. There's this facade of uh, solvency and strong reserves, and behind it is looming is, cr is a crisis, a ticking time bomb. Uh, if you take the time to read the 400-page budget that's online, the first few pages deal with the new normal with regards to CalPERS contributions. So right there, I would focus on uh, trying to stem the hemorrhaging and make payments um, above and beyond the actuarial, the lifespan table requirements. Uh, it's similar to paying down your mortgage principal or making an extra payment above the minimum required on a credit card um, to increase um, the contribution amounts to, to, to increase the net savings overall with regards to pensions. On the revenue side, uh, 
we're over reliant on the bed and what is commonly known as the bed tax or transit op occupancy tax I was referred to earlier that a lot of the hotels pay. Uh, I would like to increase the number of streams coming into the, the general fund as well as create self-sustaining enterprise funds. A big part of our budget have enterprise funds, parking, waterfront, other ones that they carry their own weight. Cannabis is huge. It's the one industry that affects agriculture, retail, manufacturing industry, regardless of how you feel about it. We need to capture that revenue and support those businesses and not even hitting seven figures on uh, multi tens of millions of dollars a year industry is kind of ridiculous. The city's leaving a lot of money on the table with that. Thank you. The wheels of democracy grind on or if the wheels grind, that's not good, right? I'm not a car guy, so your wheels roll on. I think it's probably better. Thanks. Uh, we have several questions about Santa Barbara City College. Uh, they involve uh, their one uh, person asked what are you going to do about the, new, the uh, great deal of nuisance and crime issues in residential areas that are near uh, City College. Uh, another person asked what are your biggest concerns in the City College and we have yet uh, another question that asks, uh, you get this right? Okay. Ah. What is da, 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 da. basically what do you think the relationship should be between the city and city college? So city college, and we'll uh, go, Mr. Esparza, Mr. Mr. Boyce, Mr. Campbell, Ms. Jory, and Mr. Jordan for this question. Uh, Mr. Esparza. So I think there has to be. Improvement on the relationship, you know, it is an independent district, it's its own thing, the city doesn't have much say over what happens on that campus. Um, but we do feel the consequences, especially the people that live nearby. Um, and I want to clarify something too, I was misquoted um, by uh, the online only organiz uh, news organization as saying that I thought the uh, student population was increasing and everyone knows it's been dropping off. Um, what I was pointing out then is that the City College likes to see out-of-state and international students because they get higher um, tuition. And, and that in, in effect affects the flavor of the type of students that come here and, and then use our resources and, and need housing and so forth. Um, one thing that the city could help facilitate um, is uh, more use of the om ombudsman program. Again, similar to the uh, transient population, it's not a law enforcement issue. It's probably one of the more annoying calls that police officers get to a loud party, and, and it has everyday effects. Sure, if you're not sleeping well, if you're dealing with trash in the streets, um, that really uh, decreases the quality of any neighborhood life. Um, but it's something that our precious law enforcement resources probably shouldn't be expended on. So anything that can lessen those issues and the city working together with the district, uh, I think would be a step in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boyce. Yes, sorry. The, the three questions, you said crime, nuisance. Uh, your rela relationship between relationship. the city and city college, and what do you perceive are the major issues? Yeah, I think uh, the relationship between the city and the city college is, is great. It's really strong. Um, as the only person here who uh, recently attended Santa Barbara City College, uh, I can attest to it being an incredible institution. Um, and it's hard not to enjoy, because you're, you walk out of class, and there's the ocean, and there's the beach. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes that's way more enticing than going to classes. Uh, <laughs> um, as far as communication and, and, and nuisance uh, goes, um, myself and, Gu and Councilman Gutierrez uh, are both uh, alumni and also uh, have better youth buy-in uh, to the neighborhoods, especially those that go to City College and that are renters. Um, and so uh, us being involved and, and engaged with the student population I think is a really good step forward. Um, and I hate to be labeling it, labeling it identity, identity politics, but that's kind of what it is um, because most of the people that come to our, our awesome town don't really know how things work. Uh, and so helping them understand how the culture works, um, how to respect their neighbors, and how to uh, better uh, facilitate community relations I think is really important. Um, and <laughs> lastly, yeah, just Santa Barbara City College is, is an incredible place, uh, and we have a lot of great resources. And if you ever want to go meet your neighbors, I think it's a really good opportunity to uh, experience uh, you know, people and cultures from other places and also just to, uh, you know, really build community in our town. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell. 
Yeah, City College is a beautiful college. As you know, people come from all over the world to attend this college, but it was a community college. It was always intended to be a community college. Um, I know the City College has been reported that they're operating at a $3 million deficit. Um, the way they're going to make that up is either increasing tuition for out of area students or you increase your student enrollment. The issues that have been expressed to me, especially by people who live around the area, is that they don't want to live in Isla Vista. They don't want that. Uh, people have told me about 2 a.m. wake-up calls from drunk students trying to find their way home to all sorts of other issues, to uh, students camping in tents in the medians and other places and piping TV out to them, which goes back to the housing issue with too many students that are attending the college. Um, again, public safety concern with homeless all around Pershing Park and the tennis courts. Uh, I was down at Pershing Park every Friday with football with several hundred kids that are running around. Last Friday, there were hypodermic needles in the public bathroom, and we have several hundred kids trying to go in and use the bathroom. Um, I'm concerned about all the assaults down at the Chevron station. I have a teenage daughter who's going to wind up going to classes at City College in the next couple of years. I'm concerned for her safety, and that's what I'm really worried about is the safety of our students as they walk back home after dark to wherever they live, either on the Mesa or West Beach or other places. So... Um, Talk to me more about City College. Tell me more what you all think, because that's what I've heard so far. Thank you. Ms. Jory. One of our district's biggest issues is noise and nuisance complaints around City College. To address these concerns, the police department and City College partnered up and implemented the SNAP program, Student Neighborhood Assistance Program. Um, the police department employs students to be the first responders to Mesa News area complaints. And the program works because students seem to respond to their peers. Um, I talked with Chief Lori Lunau. Um, I went on a ride along last Friday and she assured me that this program will be implemented in the next two weeks. It wasn't implemented for a while last week, or last year because they were having problem recruiting people, but I called them and told them that it really works because of our wonderful neighbor, Mary, who gives us this great data. Um, and it works, and it really helps. Um, the other thing is there's a fundamental concern that City College students are facing housing and food insecurity. It's also true that City College impacts our local housing market, and not just on the Mesa. Yes, we do need more housing for students and for staff, teachers, firefighters, construction workers, private and public employees. The question is how much, where, and who pays for it? To address these concerns, the City College is um, producing a comprehensive study looking at the realities of City College students' lives. And as your council member, I will work with the data to find a solution. Thank you. And Mr. Jordan. The good news is we have a uh, community college that's the envy of everybody in this state. That's also the bad news, of course. Um, but I believe it's a, it's a shared burden and responsibility, a shared blessing and burden. Um, City College needs to do more to address the issues adjacent to the neighborhood, and I also believe the neighborhood needs to be open to those type of fixes and what they're going to look at. Um, I'm going to advocate that City College actually approaches this like most uh, CSUs or UCs do, and they take a greater role in off-campus behavior of their students. So they, and in my experience, it would be like a dean of students who would be notified of off-campus behavior, um, either breaking the law or causing a ruckus in a neighborhood, and be able to apply some type of remedy to those students to get the point across. I'm also an advocate of trying to get kids off the road commuting into City College every day. Tremendous amount of traffic down Shoreline, up and down Cabrillo, here through here on Cliff Drive. Um, I'm willing to take that shot at a, um, a relatively small uh, test project of housing on City College property that would also include a component of uh, low-income student housing and help address some of the um, issues that others have talked about, about people who are also homeless and going to City College. Thank you. Um, here again, uh, one more thing on City College. Uh, if you've all have experienced the, the crush of traffic uh, on weekdays. 
Um, if you have ever gone to City College on a Friday, however, there is no one there. And, and that is because teachers and students don't want to take classes on Fridays. They want four-day weeks. Uh, and so having the city work with the City College to promote more classes on Fridays uh, would help ease the burden of parking in, in nearby neighborhoods and also the crush of traffic um, on Monday through Thursday. So that's a pretty easy step to take. As long as we both surf, right? Thank you. Um, uh, Next question is about water. We have several questions from uh, audience members about water. Uh, one question is, uh, how are you gonna guarantee, how would you guarantee a sustainable supply of water with all the, the development that's being proposed? Do uh, you have ideas about water regulation during times of drought? Uh, we have another question about how can you increase housing when you don't have any water? I can I give you the debate? And uh, another question about given the long-term environmental impacts of diverting water for uh, ur urban purposes, uh, what would you do about reducing uh, reliance on the river flows from the San Inez River and other such sources? Uh, let's start with Mr. Jordan on this one. So to uh, take a couple of the facts right away, if you put uh, every... Um, development in the pipeline right now in the city into place right now, it would add a half of a percent of our water use to our overall water, water year use. So the notion that we don't have the water or won't have the water is a very small consideration when you balance that against community vitality, jobs, and the ability of the rest of us to actually live. I'm a proponent of uh, continuing to live as if we will be facing a drought, if we're not in a drought, that uh, green lawns, ornamental lawns, aren't, aren't applicable for the future, and they should, uh, they should be um, look, moved out and, and replaced by uh, something that's much more friendly and water-wise. Um, we're close and closer every day to getting to a direct potable reuse as uh, you, may have, you may have opinions on that that don't work well, but, uh, but throwing, uh, in, in normal times, we process 12 million gallons a day of drinking water, we throw six or seven million gallons of, a day out into the ocean. That's water that then we have to go procure the next day. So we should be, we should be moving forward on the technology to reuse that and spread that back through the city at a minimum in our landscaping and a maximum in our drinking water. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Esparza. Well, I have a, a combination of big and, and small ideas, again, I think really addresses our lifeline. You know, waters are, without water, there's nothing. Uh, I feel like I've been leading by example at, at the home on Mohawk Road. Um, put in drought-tolerant landscaping well before the drought, and the city can in, um, do more of the incentives for, for people to rip out their lawns and, and do that. And if you need cuttings, uh, a succulents or aloe, please come by. Um, and the other thing I experimented with was rainwater capture, which it was a little bit of a hard because when you have water just sitting around and gets stagnant and so forth. But we can emulate the city of Santa Monica. They're kind of leading the way on this. They're installing two underground five million rainwater storm runoff capture tanks. Every time it rains, we just see that, you know, go and, and pollute Tavis when he's surfing. And we need to capture that. That's, I think, a huge just piece of missing infrastructure that, that the city needs to do on a bigger level. Something that goes along with that is the building a water recycling plant. And, um, and, just, and then on our, on our individual small, smaller idea level, just leading by example, doing that at our homes, you know, fixing leaks. When I called the city to fix a leaking hydrant, they were out the next day. So the city does a lot, the residents deserve a lot of credit, but we need to do, take it to the next level so we can support this growth of uh, business and developments and so forth. Thank you. Um, Ms. Drury. We can carefully manage our growth while we move forward with our workforce housing and our other projects invigorating our downtown that we need. It's very important. We need to investigate more inexpensive desal production options like Israel's desal, who's leading the industry in, um, right now in inexpensive world-class desal, um, which I believe will help stabilize our water resource and meet the community's needs. 
it's also important to utilize alternative methods um, as not to rely on one single source. Um, water banking, water purchases, water reuse, and always more water conservation is very important because no one method, no matter how we turn the coin, it's not going to fit. No one method um, will be the final solution for this precious resource and will have all the answers because all have rippling benefits and consequences to consider. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Oh, where we live is an arid climate. We're used to these droughts. We're still in a stage one drought. Um, we must have enough water because the city's already contracted to sell off 30% of the production of the desalination plant to Montecito. Uh, my issue is, is that Montecito has lower water rates than we do. Montecito has much larger lawns than we do. Why are we paying such a high price for water when other areas around us are not? As far as ornamental lawns, yeah, if you have children or dogs, it's nice to have ornamental lawns. And the other thing about lawns is they help reduce the temperature of your house, so you're less likely to turn on your air conditioning or other issues that are there as well, uh, as well as green grass and wetlands and things like that that help to turn around and uh, offset our warming gases. Um, yeah, we need to be conscientious about every drop that we use, just like everything else we do on this earth, every piece of plastic that we use, every package that we use. I mean, look how fast you fill up your trash container every week. You know, maybe we can all do a better job all across the entire board, not just water, but let's take a look at the environment as a whole. So let's, uh, let's all work together and realize that we are going to be in droughts. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Boyce. We can all agree that, that water is a critical resource and it's going to be the limiting factor to stability in this town and across the West. Uh, there's a rule of thumb in climate change science where um, with climate change, the dry gets drier and the wet gets wetter. We live in a dry climate, it's going to get drier. Uh, we're likely to see longer and more intense droughts that can last between 50 and 100 years. And frankly, we're not prepared for that. Uh, we do have diverse water sources right now. We have desalination, groundwater. Um, we collect water from Lake Kachuma. We get a third allocation of that. Gibraltar Reservoir, um, and we get a little bit of state water. On average, the city uses between uh, eight and 16,000 acre feet of water a year. Uh, that declined a lot in the last drought because homeowners uh, and consumers re started using less water. It went from 93 uh, gallons of water uh, a day to 56, I believe, uh, which is incredible. The downside to that is that um, commercial use of water has gone up, and so uh, that is one of the larger portions of water use in the city, and so encouraging businesses uh, through care and a stick approach, I think, is a good way to start reducing our water impact. Thank you. Um, that, and we're ready for our next question. We have a couple of questions about State Street. Um, basically, what are your plans uh, to uh, revitalize or improve the business climate of State Street? And we will do start with Mr. Uh, Mr. Ms. Jory, uh, then Mr. Jordan, Mr. Boyce, Mr. Esparza, and Mr. Campbell. So Ms. Jory, State Street. Uh, Santa Barbara is at a crossroads with empty storefronts on State Street. As your council member, I want to move forward with a plan that will help businesses open up their doors quicker to create revenue and jobs. As a small business owner, I know that it takes hard work and determination to be successful, but it also takes revenue and a middle class. I've talked to several businesses on State Street who are just waiting for their leases to be up, and they're out of there. They don't want to deal with the permit process. And potential businesses who want to go anywhere but State Street or even Santa Barbara, we need to streamline the permit process so the businesses can open their doors. It's, it's not a zero-sum game. We need to permit the per, permit the stream, streamline the permit process so businesses can open their doors, creating jobs, so workers will then spend money back into the economy, and the co economy will start thriving. This way, the city will have funds so that we can have provide services for our residents. We need to bring our economic heart back to Santa Barbara, um, making State Street ours again with 
community art, live music, community events, work, workforce housing, where life is vibrant, inviting, and fun again for us to go visit. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. I've just uh, stepped away from almost 15 years as a board and executive committee member of downtown Santa Barbara, which represents uh, over 1,400 uh, businesses and, and, uh, and parcel owners in the downtown, uh, downtown business district. And I, the problem is not as easy as simply changing the game from a city standpoint. Many of the parcels, once you get away from the city, are small fronts and deep parcels, so 25 or 35 feet frontages and over 100 feet deep. Those parcels in the future simply aren't equipped for the way that new retail is going to go. We need to quickly move not only towards uh, lessening the burden on going through the permitting process, but also work to rezone and reshape those parcels to reflect what's going to be there 20 years from now, and that will be smaller storefronts that serve residents that then live downtown behind those storefronts. That's the future. As my kids tell me, it's also an experiential issue. The State Street of tomorrow is not going to be the State Street that I enjoyed or you enjoyed. It's going to be much more experiential, just what Ms. Jory just alluded to. You're going to come there for a reason, not necessarily to shop, but to experience State Street. I'm also willing to talk about increasing the number of days that we close down blocks of State Street to see how that reacts to the community. Increased events like the... Um, the, uh, the CAPS project, closing State Street down and having a community, community dinner and other things on my stop sign. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Mr. Boyce. Well, Mike just took everything I was going uh, <laughs> <laughs> to say. <laughs> well, me and your kids have been texting a lot, so maybe they, they took my ideas. Anyways, uh, State Street, <laughs> there's, there's a couple issues we have to look at. Number one, um, Everyone is going to talk about cutting red tape and uh, making things streamlined. That process is, is difficult, of course, and everyone promises it. Uh, the other part is trends that we have to look at. Um, with the global changing economic landscape, uh, retail stores, brick and mortar stores are not going to be as relevant. And so having more experiential businesses is super important. Uh, a lot of the largest spaces right now that um, are, are sitting there empty. Uh, we also have this, this housing crisis where we don't have enough housing. So put two and two together, you might figure something out. Um, I'm an MBA student at Cal State Ch Channel Islands, and so I'm constantly thinking of really fun things to do, new, new business ventures. If you go to any coffee shop in Santa Barbara, any day of the week, my favorite one's Lighthouse Coffee over here in the Mesa, um, you will see everyone in there on their computers. Those people are students at school, but most of them are actually running businesses, and they post up there all day long. <laughs> they live in the coffee shops, and I'm sure that they would love uh, an opportunity to have a store or a business front on State Street. Thank you. Mr. Esparza. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of good ideas, and here's what some of these bigger ideas seem uh, like they, how they can play out to me, uh, or play out in, in my view. Uh, streamlining. Um, permitting process, this entitlement process that takes years to open up as opposed to the months it should take. Um, how about opening the community development department open on Fridays? I mean, all the city offices should be open on Fridays, but let's start there. You know, if, if, if we want to open doors, let's open up the city business doors where you get these permits. Um, and what I've heard from landlords, especially on State Street and these cavernous spaces that, that Mr. Jordan referred to, uh, the, the, the dividing of them is, is very difficult or nearly impossible. You know, sometimes it's for very good reasons, like fire sprinklers and whatnot, but it shouldn't take three tenants to lease a space, which is what you're seeing more often, these uh, joint efforts to, to, to split the overhead. Um, so anything that could be done to, to make the spaces more suitable for modern tenants, I think is something that the, we, can, we can look at. And that's what I think the streamlining, streamlining should accomplish. Um, citywide internet, you know, these are kind of things that could probably be done pretty easily. I mean, we have all these coffee shops bearing the burden of people just um, squatting and using the free internet. So I would support the city being a truly smart city. And also, if we're going to be putting 5Gs everywhere, let's make a public network available for at least public non-commercial use for people that want to check their email and so forth. Um, stop sign. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Um, I've also talked to a lot of businesses, those that have tried to go through the process, as well as those that have succeeded 
Um, so I mirror a lot of what everybody says. Citywide Wi-Fi so they don't squat in spots is also very, very great too. Um, you know, there are businesses already in the funk zone, like the project and over at Llama Dog. They've already figured out how to take large spaces and break them up and have several businesses under one roof because, as has been pointed out, a lot of these square footage of even the first level is too large for the modern business. People want experiential, uh, they want experiences. You know, they're not necessarily shopping for products and whatnot. And then you have all this uh, housing that could be upstairs in the second and third stories. Again, that would help solve a lot of our solving, a lot of our housing issues. I have a proposal too that if indeed the police station moves forward with the Coda Street lot, we should do the farmer's market for starters on Saturdays to start shutting down State Street just like we do on Tuesdays. Draw more people to the downtown area, to the storefronts. And that's a great gateway, a great step into seeing if closing State Street between Haley and say Ken and Perdido is really a truly viable thing or not, if it really brings people to the downtown area. And I have one more issue. Whenever we talk about State Street and its vitalization, everybody always talks about lower State Street. No one ever talks about the middle of State Street. Why? How about upper State Street? Why? Why doesn't anybody talk about the rest of State Street? Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, I think we can get one more question in uh, before the closing statements, and we'll end just about right on time, I think. Um, and we had a couple of questions, interestingly enough, about young people. Uh, how do you plan to get young people, our future, more involved in politics? And what is the best way to communicate with young people about the basic functions and responsibilities of local government? Uh, and we'll go back to the alphabetical order with Mr. Boise going, Boise going first. Uh, this has been a pretty fun journey the last 10 months uh, running for city council. And the one question I get over and over again from everybody is, so what do you actually do on city council? <laughs> what, what is the title? What is the job? I don't get it. And so it's not just uh, young people who don't understand how local government works. It's pretty much everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's not a bad thing. It's just kind of uh, a lot of the political energy right now is focused on the national level. Um, as far as young people go, I help run a junior lifeguard program where we have 280 kids every summer um, down at Hendry's Beach. Um, and I teach uh, 64 <laughs> kids in my group twice a summer, uh, mostly 11-year-olds, and so I, I think I have a better affinity um, and, and ability to work with young people. I also help run a nonprofit called the Kiki Paddle uh, that we organize every summer. We paddle pretty much from Goleta Beach to the harbor, 100 kids, 20 boats, and we raise $40,000 for a kid with cancer in Santa Barbara. Um, so my skills as a nonprofit organizer and as a uh, lifeguard organizer uh, are definitely coming into play, and engaging young people is kind of what I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell. You know, a really good question, especially since I'm not a politician. I've never run for an office before. I never thought I would ever run for a political office. With that being said, I've been many, on many boards, I've been treasurer of boards. I'm a CFO of another private board. Uh, I help out in a lot of private industries with children and whatnot. And I encourage children to get involved. Like my daughter, she's part of the board of the Junior Sailing Foundation. Because the only way that you're going to affect your neighborhood, your community, or any place else is if you get involved. And it doesn't have to be in politics. A lot of times it has to do with community stuff. And Santa Barbara has such a large number of nonprofits and community organizations. I mean, there's a group of people that meet down by Mesa Lane Steps to talk about homeless and other issues on a regular basis. There's quite a few men that sit down and they talk about business over at Mesa Cafe every Saturday morning for breakfast. Get involved, you know, encourage your children to be involved, encourage them to have a voice. Um, one of my big things in business and managing people, my philosophy has always been is that I need to train my replacement. I need to train somebody to do my job so this way I can go on and do something else. And so I always looked at mentoring younger people to step up, to move forward, to move up ladders so they can achieve more, such as buying a house getting better paying jobs, getting more responsibilities. And that's what I do is I lead by youth examples. Thank you. Mr. Esparza. So one of the marks of a good local community is how well that community takes care of its vulnerable populations. And in the cycle of life, I always saw that as um, the youth and, and seniors. And we have a lot to learn from our youth. Uh, I was my, I have a young son who's about to turn five and 
I was his AYSO coach last year. Um, it was one of the most rewarding experiences uh, working with my team and also because I, I learned from them. You know, you take a minute to listen to them and you realize that they have uh, no filters, but also that is good for when you need, <laughs> the, some of our city issues can, can use that lack of filters. Uh, so uh, as a council member, I, I, I would treat them as any other constituent, you know, kind of as if they could vote. And an example is as that there is one forum left after this, uh, the youth council, which is um, uh, young people who try to be involved and, and are on a city advisory group, um, uh, as, as some of us were up here in the past. And uh, they're having, they're putting together um, a forum where where the youth is in charge of running it and presenting the questions. And I believe that's the 28th of this month uh, at the, uh, the corner of Victoria and what's that, the, the Lure Louise Center down there. Um, Chapala and, and, and Victoria, right. And, and, and so yeah, just um, keeping an ear open to everybody, um, including, including the youth is important is what I would do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jordan. It's a great question, but it really doesn't encompass uh, the full spectrum of the issue. In, in addition to just young people, you should be asking the same question about those who are underrepresented and at risk in our society, whether that's differences in gender, age, uh, sexual identification, whatever that may be, and how we're going to continue to involve them in this community going forward. I don't really want to disparage a former mayor sitting in the room, but my my first foray into city politics was as a Creeks advisory member back in the early 90s, and I remember looking at council and saying, it's a bunch of old people with no kids in the house and a bunch of very young people who are crazy advocates. Where were the 35-year-olds who had children in their household representing their interests? And of course, the answer is, is that they're home taking care of their children instead of involved in politics. <laughs> Uh, this is probably not the right district to worry about that dynamic. There are other districts on the east and west side that, that certainly would have this issue of how are you going to represent us as another district member but involve us in the community. And I'll pledge again to be inclusive, uh, transparent, and open to all and involve uh, interns, involve working groups, whatever that may take. I recognize that my frame of reference, even your frame of reference, is not everybody's frame of reference and we need to uh, respond to everybody's. And Ms. Droy. I want to add to what Mike said about the marginalized groups. So it's not just the young people or the marginalized groups. This is something that we deal with every year. And every year we say, I think this year we're going to have more people vote. And we don't. We don't. One of my great mentors, who is a voting expert, um, in 2016, I said, I know this year that there were more people voting. And there weren't. So it's we have to all be engaged. And to answer the specific question about young people, I'm proud to say I have a lot of young people on my campaign volunteering. If any of you have seen the, the photo of me and a lot of my volunteers, um, part of that is me. Um, part of that is because they like my energy. I'm very energetic and passionate, and I'm very involved with the arts and um, State Street Ballet, so a lot of them are dancers. A lot of them are students from City College. Um, but a lot of that also is my son and daughter are engaged in politics. And my daughter actually is did something for the League of Women Voters to try and engage her peers. So it was very exciting she got to, to do this whole thing. Um, so their friends tell their friends, and that's how it is. And it is very important that we get the young people involved because we do have really crucial issues like sea level rise, and that's super important, and it will affect the young people more than us. Thank you very much. Uh, now each of the candidates will have time up to a minute and a half uh, for closing remarks, uh, and uh, we will start do it in reverse alphabetical order, uh, starting with Ms. Jory, uh, then Mr. Jordan, Mr. Esparza, Mr. Campbell, and last, Mr. Boyce. So Ms. Jory, your closing remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you again for being here. 
I will move Santa Barbara forward with fresh, bold leadership because I have vision and experience in making things happen. I'm already delivering the changes needed to advancing our community forward. In addition to my proven collaborative leadership skills, I also have an artistic vision. I was awarded the Visionary Award from State Street Ballet um, for initiating an innovative approach to dance education, as well as creating the popular wine and ballet event where dancers interpret wine through movement. Um, it's unique and rare to be able to understand and implement the nuts and bolts of a city while at the same time having an artistic vision to be able to bring the community together. Currently, the City Council has no arts liaison to bring the community together and to something that we desperately, desperately, desperately need, and that's a vacancy that, that I can help fill. Look, we're not the only city experiencing these issues, but we're one of the only cities that's not being proactive in trying to find solutions. And that's because we have, we're in a systemic culture of do nothing and obstruct the project. Let's become a model city once again for your children and my children. I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. We all share calling Santa Barbara our home. Certainly it's a very special place to live, raise our children, and be part of a community. We're so, future, we're so fortunate, though, that the challenges and concerns we have are, at, are, are more like opportunities to improve what's already here rather than what defines us as a city or any other city. I'm ready to build on that uh, foundation. I'll not be a council member who ignores the less fortunate among us, seeking to simply push them out of sight equating compassion to enabling and, and pushing fear as an agenda. I will work to protect what each of us have while working to lift those up who are less fortunate, setting a foundation for a future that builds community rather than further separates us. I'll also not be a council member who claims environmental stewardship but privately agrees to increased oil and natural gas production in this region. I'll work to protect and build on the environmental successes of the past 50 years and position our city to responsibly and environmentally meet the challenges of the future ahead. I will be a council member who's engaged, transparent, and inclusive, one who works to recognize and remedy the tensions and shortcomings that exist in city policies and practices and improve the everyday lives of our community. I invite you to join me on this journey. The ideas and answers m lie much more with you than any elected official, and I'd ask for your support and your vote for Mike Jordan for City Council. Thank you. Mr. Esparza. So what I think I represent is change. And if you want some more of the same, I mean, things are good in Santa Barbara. We're all fortunate, all in all, give credit where credit's due. It's a pretty well-run city. Services are, are good. Uh, but there are some things that require change. There are some things I think most people can agree on that are, um, um, are, are, are worthy of addressing. And these races, these local races are part of that. If you want some of the same stuff, if you want the same candidates self-endorsing each other, self-funding each other, then don't vote for me. But if you want change, if you want someone to bring new, fresh, bold ideas to, to pre adequately prepare for some of the future problems that we're gonna be facing, then I think I'm your guy. And I ask for your vote because I feel I'm the most qualified. Uh, my, one of my entrances back into public services happened recently when former Governor Brown appointed me to the Ir Warren Showgrounds Board. And Similar to the city, there's pressing issues there. That's, I think that's one of the reasons I was brought to serve on that board, was to bring a fresh perspective, was to bring new ideas, was to bring change. Um, rather than give a city employee just a new title and a raise, let's have a true economic development department and, and really promote business. Let's have uh, auto parking lots and re-examine city assets and increase revenue and do things that make sense just on an everyday level. Some of you might have already voted. I mean, that's another thing that I think is wrong with the city. We can't even hold an election. You know, this whole by mail thing, an election shouldn't be the first thing that we look to cut to try to save a little bit of money. But since that's how it is, I urge you to go home, if you haven't already, fill that thing out, put it in the secrecy sleeve, put it in the envelope, and mail it in. I appreciate your vote. 
Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And I want to uh, okay. clarify because I'm not sure exactly what the statements are about self-funding or otherwise, because I know I personally only contributed $10 to my own committee, and I haven't gotten any money from any political committees either. So I've personally knocked on over 770 doors. I've talked to 621 people directly, business owners from everybody all over the city. Um, there are a tremendous amount of great ideas that have come from this panel. I mean, if only all of us could go on and just replace the entire city council right now, I think this city would do phenomenally, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, this is a beautiful place. I chose to live here. And I had a client 15 years ago tell me, he's like, Santa Barbara's an unreal place. I said, what do you mean it's unreal? He's like, this is unreal. And we were just walking down the beach and some stranger let his son take the fishing rod and fish off the beach with a complete and total stranger. And he said, you know what? The weather's way too nice here. He said, the people are way too friendly. He said, real estate's outrageously expensive and nobody seems to work a real job. Everybody's at the volleyball courts are full. You know, but with that said, we do have issues and we do need to work on them. And I'm from New York, born and raised. I've been through the Giuliani days when New York was filthy, unclean and unsafe. And we lost a lot of tourism, a lot of people and a lot of businesses didn't want to be there. And I've experienced all that. And that's kind of what I've seen here. And that's one of my issues with over this area of the mesas. I don't want it to turn into that either. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boys. Yeah, I want to talk about our vision for the Mesa because I think we have something really good going on here. Uh, my dad always talked about, you know, an indicator for a great community is one where the kids can ride their bus, or their bikes to the bus stop, leave their bikes there, come back after school, and their bikes are unlocked on the ground. They pick them up and ride home. And I think we've we've almost achieved that here in the Mesa. And I, and I want to help the rest of Santa Barbara feel the same way that we do because we're really lucky. The second thing I want to talk about um, is the urgency of the issues that we're talking about up here, because whatever we decide, whatever, whoever gets elected up here, whoever gets, gets picked, their decisions are going to impact me for the rest of my life. They're going to impact your kids for the rest of their lives. They're, you're going to, they're going to impact their grandkids and so on. The future of Santa Barbara and the future of our generations to come uh, is really in the balance. And we have this saying in lifeguarding, it's called preventative lifeguarding, where instead of watching you know, kids play in a, in a rip current and they get sucked out, you go rescue them. You run down before they get to the rip current and pull them out of the water and you say, hey, maybe over there is a better place. Uh, that kind of preventative action I think is really necessary right now in terms of legislation because climate change is going to be coming down the pike. Things are going to start changing. Sea levels rising. Fires are going to continue. We're going to have more mudslides. Uh, and this is a future that I don't want. I'd rather be surfing. <laughs> But I'm here right now because I care about my future and I care about your kids' futures. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Being applauded. Thanks. Thanks to uh, the Free, Mer uh, Free Methodist Church, to Transil Pro for the, uh, translating the form from English to Spanish, and to Gary Atkins Sound for the sound system. Um, <laughs> Yeah, very nice. Well done. The forum will be live streamed by TVSB on, uh, it will be on Facebook at LWVSB. I may get this techno stuff wrong. Uh, kind of a Luddite, my own self. Uh, TVSB will also videotape the forum and it will be broadcast on channel 17 and 71 will also be available on the local League of Women Voters YouTube site. Uh, there's a link on our uh, website at lwvsantabarbara.org. Thank you, candidates, for joining us this evening and participating in a, a lively and informative forum. We appreciate your drive and your commitment to serve our community. Thank you to the audience for joining us, helping make democracy work. We hope you found the program informative and useful as you prepare to vote. And as a last reminder, make sure you are registered to vote. The deadline for registration is October 21st. And please vote. Uh, democracy depends in the last analysis on people voting. The city mailed the ballots on October 7th. They must be returned to City Hall 
we're at a drop-off place. Does anybody know if Holy Cross is a drop-off place? Holy Cross is a drop-off place uh, by Election Day, November 5th. Good night. Drive safely. Cliff Drive is a bear. Thank you.